In a moment, I'll play pink noise out of this speaker, which will be picked up by this microphone. So in the DAW, let's arm the microphone so we can hear what's going on, and we'll play the pink noise. If I add another microphone, what do you think will happen? Let's arm that mic as well and play the pink noise. Ah, so look at the meter here. With only one mic, it's at about minus 18 dBFS, and with two mics, we gain some level. So the two signals from the microphones add together and combine to create a stronger signal. But listen to what happens when I change the relative distance between each mic and the sound source. Now, the sound from the speaker has to travel a bit further distance in order to reach the second microphone, and that results in a slight delay between the two mics. This is called a time of arrival difference. When those signals are mixed together, some frequencies will add together and some will cancel out, and this is called comb filtering because the resulting pattern on the graph resembles a comb. Anytime you place more than one microphone on a single sound source, the chance of phase interference and comb filtering increases. Let's say you're going to place two microphones on the same guitar cabinet. As you're dialing in the sound, listen for any phase interference between the two mics. You can do this by making a test recording and then comparing the two signals or waveforms within the DAW. If we zoom in here on the DAW, we can see that these mics are reaching the microphone at about the same time, and the signals seem to be in phase for the most part. If the waveforms were not aligned in the DAW like that, you could manually adjust the position of one of the microphones to be a bit closer or further from the source, aiming to match the distance of the other microphone. Then you could record another take and compare the waveforms again. Let's take a listen to the effect that you can expect when the microphones are in alignment versus out of alignment. In a live situation where you can't look at the waveforms side by side, you can try inverting the polarity of one mic and listening for a change in tone. In this case, the signal got a lot quieter and it lost a lot of definition, which indicates that the frequencies were in phase before flipping the polarity, and now that they were flipped out of polarity, they almost completely cancel. So in this case, let's turn off the polarity switch, and if it sounds good, we can move forward. If flipping the mics out of polarity didn't result in a big difference, or if both options sounded bad, you can try adjusting the distance between the two mics and the source. When you get the alignment right, the guitar will sound full with greater clarity. In this particular case, my amp is very noisy, and this could actually work in our favor. Let me flip the polarity on one of these microphones. With the polarity flipped, the noise cancels between the two microphones when they're in alignment. As I take them out of alignment, the noise is audible because they're no longer canceling perfectly. When I get to perfect alignment, the noise cancels almost entirely, 
but it comes back if I go too far in the other direction. So if we align them to where the noise disappears, and then we unflip the polarity, now the noise unfortunately sums together, but that does indicate that these two microphones are the same distance from that speaker. Now you may be asking, why can't we just adjust the alignment by shifting the region within the DAW? First of all, it's a very resourceful idea, so kudos to you if you're asking that question. Secondly, you can do this, but it doesn't always have a positive effect. I'll get to the reason why later on in this video. Now we're going to record acoustic guitar. For a wide sound that spreads the guitar across the two speakers, we can use two microphones and pan one to the left and the other off to the right, which will offer a more immersive experience for the listener. One advantage of using a coincident pair, like this XY technique, is that the two signals from the microphones will already be in fairly close alignment because the microphones themselves are placed in effectively the same position in space. So for this XY technique, let's pan this microphone a little bit to the left and this microphone a little bit to the right. Let's go all the way here at first, even though you don't necessarily have to do that. Now, this isn't to say you can't capture great sounding recordings with non-coincident microphone techniques. The time of arrival difference between two microphones in near coincident techniques like ORTF can actually simulate an interaural timing difference, which is a cue for our auditory system that helps us to identify where sounds come from. Just remember that if the left and right channel of your recording are ever played back through a mono system with only one speaker channel, it may not sound good if there are undesirable phase interactions between the left and right channel of your mix. So it's a good idea to check mono compatibility of your mix by testing the stereo mix in mono and listening for the dropout of clarity that we heard earlier with the polarity test. Spacing the mics even further apart like this can make for a larger than life recording where the acoustic guitar seems bigger. For example, one microphone could be pointed to where the neck meets the body, and the other could be pointed to the place between the bridge and the end of the guitar. The mics don't necessarily need to be panned hard left and right. You could experiment with subtle or very wide stereo images. So here they're panned hard left and right. but we can experiment with just panning them maybe 40% or so to the left and 40% or so to the right. In addition to summing the mix to mono or using the polarity flip technique, you might also try using a Lissajous meter, which helps to visualize the coherence between the two signals. In this case, I've got a meter called Isotope Insight, which is designed for stereo signals. So I'll route one mic hard to the left and the other one hard to the right. Let's take a brief moment to understand what this meter is telling us. Think of this meter as a graph that shows channel one on the x-axis 
and channel 2 on the y-axis. The graph is tilted for a more intuitive experience when mixing in stereo. To understand how this relates to microphone alignment, let's take this pair of 1 Hz sound waves as an example. They're currently in phase, which means that the positive periods and negative periods are aligned. Because they're both electronically generated sine waves, they are exactly the same and they form a perfectly straight line on the meter. If I mute the right channel, the left channel signal will be shown as a straight line on the x-axis. And if I mute the left channel, the right channel will be shown as a straight line on the y-axis. Shifting the signals by 180 degrees will result in a perfectly horizontal line on the meter, indicating 100% incoherence between the left and right channel. A 90 degree offset will result in a circle. And anything in between will form some sort of ellipse. When you're dealing with more complex sound waves that contain many frequencies, you'll need to interpret these general shapes from the more complex readings on the meter. A line that's generally vertical on this graph or equal along the x and y axis indicates that the left and right channel are coherent compared to a horizontal line. So let's listen to our acoustic guitar recording on this graph. The two signals are not coherent, so we shouldn't expect a perfectly vertical line. Different frequencies approach each mic, and there is a timing difference just given the physical size of the instrument and the fact that the two mics are not aligned in the perfectly same point in space. But that general vertical circle tells us that these mics are working well together. In fact, let's see what happens when we invert the polarity of one of them. So that's a good thing. When they were out of polarity, the ellipse was very horizontal, which indicates a lot of incoherence between the two channels. And when they were in polarity, the graph created a somewhat vertical ellipse. I could go back and experiment again and again, and because it's just me here recording myself, that's ultimately what I would need to do. But if you're recording someone else, you might put on some isolation headphones and place the microphones while they're playing so that you can adjust and hear the effect in real time. It's important to consider that a moving source is effectively the same as a moving microphone. So try to keep the performer and the instrument in the same position if you want the take to be consistent throughout the performance. Back to the question about aligning the phase by shifting the waveforms within the DAW. Imagine you're mixing a drum kit that consists of two kick drum mics, two snare drum mics, and one overhead microphone. First, we need to do some basic testing by listening to the snare top and snare bottom together. If you think of a drum, as the top head moves down, the bottom head moves down. The top microphone on a snare is pointed downward, so it gets a quick negative transient, as the upward pointing bottom mic captures a quick positive transient. Assuming the mics are somewhat evenly spaced from the drum, you can usually find more body by inverting the polarity of one mic. Again, listen for the same thing that we heard on the other examples and just choose the option that sounds best. Now, let's take a look at the kick drum mics. These are also capturing different parts of the instrument, so there will be incoherence between the mics. That's expected. But we might experiment by swapping the polarity on one mic again.
The problem here is that one mic is very clearly placed closer to the batter of the kick drum where the initial sound originates. This might be a situation to use delay. You can place a delay on one channel and set it to compensate for the timing offset. Here on the DAW timeline, I can measure the time difference between the two clips and set the delay on the first channel to compensate for it. Again, in live situations, you won't usually have a tool that allows you to view the waveforms like this, unless you're using a plugin like Waves in Phase. In those cases where you don't have a tool, you can flip the polarity of one mic and adjust the delay until maximum cancellation occurs. This is similar to what we heard with my noisy guitar amp. Then, with the out of polarity signals in maximum incoherence, we can simply unflip the polarity and the signals should sum together quite nicely. Next, we can play the snare channels together with the drum overhead mic and do the polarity test. You can run the same test on the kick drum. If you found a configuration that sounds good, you could just move on. But if you feel the need to invest the time into delaying the snare and kick to the overheads, you can. You just do the same thing that we did with the kick drum mics. Sometimes this works and other times it doesn't. Listen to these examples and tell me what you think in the comments. Even though you can get some added punch and clearer transients on the snare and kick by doing this, it almost always comes at the cost of shifting all of the other phase relationships between the surrounding instruments. The bleed from the surrounding instruments like cymbals and the snare mic and snare mic and the kick mic will now all interact differently with the overheads. So honestly, it's all kind of a big mess, but handling phase alignment in recording is mostly about choosing your battles and priorities because you can never really get everything right. And we're used to everything not being right from when we've listened to instruments in a real room. So it's okay if your recording is imperfect. At the end of the day, if it sounds good, it is good. If you don't believe me, watch the next video.